Welcome to church. By the grace of God, we are here again today. It is Sunday morning. We are excited. The word of God delivers. The word of God encourages. The word of God is the love of God. Welcome to church again. This is a church without boundaries, a church without borders, meaning you can reach us anytime, anywhere, and you will be encouraged. You will get that word which will see you through any situation, a word that will lift you up, a word that will give you the grace of God that will change your situation. This is the stables of the virtuous woman with Reverend Sylvia Nawa. Let's get into the word of God. And today I'm talking about the grace of God. The grace of God. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. And the Bible reads, Let's start from verse 9. We get the gist of the matter. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Father, thank you for your word that strengthens, that encourages, that uplifts, that heals, that answers our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that even as I speak, mighty God, may your anointing be upon your people. Let them receive your, people, your word and let it grow root in their hearts. Let their minds be alert and their hearts receptive. Let me speak direct from you as I hear you speak, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we've prayed and asked. Amen and amen. Paul is saying, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. So you ask yourself a question, what was going on with Paul? Where is Paul coming from with this statement or with this declaration? That I am what I am, but by the grace of God. What is the grace of God? The grace of God, I am what I am. It has made me who I am, or it has made me what I am at this point in time. The grace of God. The grace of God can be interpreted in a number of ways. Because God can be interpreted in a number of ways. God appears to us. God has... Uh, has this effect on, on us in different ways. And because of that, there can be many interpretations that come with that. But today, I'm going to zero in on the fact that the grace of God is the love of God. The grace of God is the love of God, the power of God that creates or that recreates. That is the grace of God. Why am I saying that creates or that recreates? When you look at Paul, he is saying, I am what I am. So cast back, where is he coming from? For him to reach a point where he says, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. We are learning a lesson here. Somebody may be in a situation out there, child of God, that maybe you were in a bad, uh, in bad company, or maybe your life was not right. Maybe you are full of shame because maybe the past experience is you were a prostitute. Maybe you were a thief. Maybe you were a big liar. Maybe you were just this person who unsettles everybody. Someone who's always in trouble or always causing trouble. And then you encounter God. And you are able to declare, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. By the love of God by the power of God. So we look at Paul's life. Where was he coming from? When you go to the book of Acts, you go to the book of Acts. Here is Paul in Acts chapter 7. Stephen the martyr, Stephen is being stoned. Why is Stephen being stoned? Because when you go back to chapter 6, there is something that there is an allegation against him from the Pharisees or by the Pharisees. That no, Stephen is trying to change the, 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 the law of Moses which was handed down to us. Remember, these are Pharisees. They are learned in the law, just like Paul is. 
learned, very well learned in the law. And they are following the laws of Moses. The Mosaic laws is what they are following. They are following the law of Moses. So they have studied it. And anything that wants to come against or anybody that wants to come against the law of Moses, they'll fight them. And that's what they are doing. Stephen was trying to talk to them and teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord Jesus Christ has come and died for our sins. Come and atoned for our sins. That we need to change. This is the time of the grace dispensation. Ah, he was perceived as the enemy. And so there was an allegation, a charge against him. They went to the high priests and placed a charge against him. To say this man says the, the Jesus that he is preaching, that Jesus is going to destroy this temple and destroy the mosaic laws so that he can establish his kingdom. So in chapter 7, the chief priests are asking him, is this true? What does Stephen do? He goes back to Genesis from Genesis from Father Abraham and takes them step by step up to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and how the Lord Jesus Christ has died and gone back to the Father and that we will also die and go to the Father because he came to atone for our sins. Ah, they were not happy with that. They took him outside and they stoned him. And while they were stoning him, there was this young man, Paul. He was standing there and nodding. He was in agreement. You see, understand, Paul was very learned in the laws, the Mosaic laws. He was a Pharisee. Because somewhere in the book of Corinthians, Corinthians he even says, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know? As for legality, zealous to persecute the church. Paul was one of those that sat under the greatest teachers of that time, Gamaliel was very, very well educated and very well versed in the laws, the Mosaic laws, in what the prophets had declared before. But he missed one thing. He missed the prophet about that David's stamp would always be on the throne. Meaning that from David, his stamp means that there would always be part of him that would be on the throne. And when you look at the lineage, you continue to go through and look at the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ comes from that line. That is the stamp, the stamp of Jesse, that he will always be on the throne as the prophets had declared. This is the word of God. But that Paul missed because he was too steeped into the laws. So he did not foresee the Jesus. He did not believe in Jesus. And therefore he is persecuting the church. He is, according to him, he's doing the right thing. But he missed that point of Jesus. He missed that point of Jesus. And maybe there was a purpose for that. <laughs> so here is Paul. Here is Paul. Now going to, he's even got consent from the chief priests to go and persecute the church wherever they will be found, those men or women who address themselves or those who said they belonged to Jesus, he would persecute them. Because according to him, they were doing the wrong thing. He had missed the point of Jesus. And therefore he's on his way to Damascus after Stephen in Acts 7 has been stoned. Paul was giving consent to that. In Acts 9, Paul meets with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 9, let's just look at the word briefly. Acts 9. So from verse, verse 2, verse 3, let me start from verse 3. As he neared Damascus, on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a, no, a voice say to him, So, so, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? So asked. <laughs> so, so, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? So asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, Now get up and go into the city and you will be told 
what you must do. The men traveling with souls, do they speechless? They heard their voice, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. Saul, so, Saul, so, why do you persecute me? And Saul replies, who are you, Lord? How did Paul know that it was the Lord? How did he know that it was the Lord who was calling him? You see, when you have an encounter with God, it is so much out of the ordinary, it's so extraordinary, the encounter, that you will know that this is none other than God. You will know. You won't need to be told by anybody. You will know. Because your spirit, the spirit who's in you, remember, you were made in the image of God and in his likeness. In his likeness means the spirit of God, when he breathed his spirit into his breath into man, God's spirit is in man. You are a spirit man, a spirit being. Your spirit communicates or witnesses with the spirit of God. So when you have an encounter with God, God being made in the likeness, man being made in the likeness of God has the characteristics of God because you have the spirit of God. The spirit, the spirit man is directly from the upper room of God where he operates from. That's why he says, before you were woven in your mother's womb, I knew you. So when you have an encounter with him, your spirit, which is the spirit of God, the spirit man in you, will have a witness. This is deep, child of God. This is deep. But that is the witness that comes that you don't need to be told by anybody. You will know. Because the spirit of God and the spirit of God who is in you, they will interconnect. They will connect, and you will know this is God. Paul, Paul, so, so, why do you persecute me? And Paul answers, so answers, who are you, Lord? He even says, Lord, he knew who he was. It's an encounter that changes you. If you were not baptized in the Holy Ghost, at that instant you will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. We encounter God in very different ways. Look at the way Paul, Saul, encountered God. Yet God wanted him to be the vessel that he was going to use. We encounter God. Some of us will encounter God because we are sick. And we cry out to God. And he appears. He touches and heals you. You are in trouble. You feel trapped. You are in a situation where you are finding, I can't get out of this. How? How am I going to get out? You cry out to God. And suddenly there is an angel. You are rescued. You are in a situation where you are being abused. And you cry out to God. And God sends an angel. God will encounter him in different ways. But in every way, however you encounter him, child of God, you will know because of the spirit of God, the breath of God that is breathed into us when he was making us to make us a speaking man, a speaking being. We have the characteristics of God made in his image and in his likeness. Who are you, Lord? Paul is asking. So he continues now. This is a process. He continues. He gets up from the ground because he's, this light landed him on the ground. When he gets up, opens his eyes, he can't see. He's gone blind. This is just the beginning of God processing soul. God processes us when he has elected us, when he has predestined us elected to be used as his vessels. The process of soul starts. He says, go to Damascus and there you will find a man. You will find a man. Now get up, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The assignment 
It's starting. The processing of soul is starting. Child of God, when you are at the beginning of your assignment, I know you'll be confused a bit. You won't know what to do. But listen carefully. If you are hearing this word, you are hearing the right word. And this is the right moment for you. This is the right moment for you. Just hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You will be told what to do. Meaning the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do all the way. The Holy Spirit will guide you, will lead you, will tell you, will be with you. But by the grace of God. Meaning the grace of God will also be with you everywhere you are going. The power of God, the love of God will steer you on. Show you what you are supposed to do. Encourage you, strengthen you, uplift you. He will be there all the time. Obviously, the men that were with Paul would not see anything. It was not theirs. The assignment was for Paul. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see. They led him into Damascus, and for three days, he didn't eat or drink. You see, Paul was accustomed to this. He was a man learned in law, so he knew when to fast and when not to fast. This was one of the times he realized, here, I need to fast. Why is he fasting? Because he wants to hear God clearly. When you are fasting, you are elevating yourself. You are bringing yourself into the presence of God so that you can hear him clearly. That is what fasting is all about. You are denying yourself and you are making a decision to say, I want to hear you well, Lord. I want to hear you clearly. I have a situation here. Paul knew he had a situation. He went into fasting and prayer for three days. He wanted to know what God wanted him to do. God had already given him an instruction. You will be told what to do. So he needed to hear clearly what God was telling him to do. A disciple named Ananias, God called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of, Ju of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he, he is praying, you see, three days and three nights. He was praying, he was fasting. In a vision, he has seen a man, as he was praying, can you see this? He has seen a man named Ananias come to him. If he didn't pray, was he going to see this man? Maybe not at this point. But you see, Paul knew what to do. So he was praying, fasting and praying, bringing himself into the presence of God so that he can know exactly what God wants him to do. And he showed him a vision. That is the step you take. You go into a fast, bring yourself into the, the presence of God so that you can hear God clearly or see God clearly and get the instruction that he is giving you. And Nas was not very excited about that message. <laughs> he says, this man is persecuting the church, Lord. Nevertheless, the Lord answered Ananias, I have heard many reports about this man, Lord, and all the harm he has done to us. But the Lord said to Ananias in verse 15, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry out my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. This man is going to be my instrument. From persecuting the church, he has an encounter with God. And before he knows it, he is the instrument God had already he foreknew him. He foreknew him. He had already preordained and predestined him to say this man is going to be my instrument before the Gentiles and their kings and Israel as well. Oh, he foreknows us. So he justifies, he preordains us, predestines us. Paul is at the beginning of his assignment. And the, the, the Bible says, he says, uh, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And indeed, Paul suffered for the name of the Lord. Before the Gentiles, before the kings of the Gentiles, and before Israel itself. He has written, in that he has written most of the New Testament that we are speaking, reading on, and feeding on today. He says, I am what I am but by the grace of God. 
I am what I am, but by the grace of God. So you can see the grace of God, the power of God, the recreating power of God has recreated Paul from being one who's persecuting the church to being one who is now an instrument of God. That is how the power of God, that is how the grace of God translates us from being an instrument which was not so noble to an instrument that God is going to use. He recreates the grace of God. It's the recreating power of God. Paul declared, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. When you go into the Bible, there are other examples. You look at Rahab. Rahab helped the, 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 the two spies. They were going to be uh, they were going to be killed, but he helped. She helped them escape. Look at how God looked that that act ushered her into being one of the women, very prominent women in the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ, because she got married to Joshua. When you look at Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector. Rahab was a prostitute, but she became the instrument that God used in the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. You look at Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Rahab, you find her in Joshua too. Zacchaeus, you find him in Luke 19. And he was translated, just an encounter with God when Jesus said, today I'm going to your house, I'm going to sit at your table in your house. Zacchaeus comes down and says, from today onwards I've changed. He became a changed man. He was a very unscrupulous uh, tax collector. And he says, if I have cheated anybody, I'll pay them back four times. That's what happens when you encounter the grace of God, you are recreated. When you encounter the grace of God, the love of God, you will be recreated into the instrument that God is going to use. Into the instrument that God is going to use. You've heard the word of God. If you haven't had a chance to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, say this prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word. Your word which is sharper than any two-edged two sword. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me on that cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, that your word can recreate me, that I can be your instrument. Today, I choose, I live my life of sin, and I choose to follow you, to be in your family, in the name of Jesus with that, congratulations. Find a Bible teaching church. Get yourself a Bible. Start reading them from the book of John, the love of God. You will find it there. The grace of God is the recreating power of God, which changes you from what you are into an instrument that God is going to use. Until next time, this has been Reverend Sylvia now. From the stables of the virtuous woman, church without borders, church without boundaries. It is shalom and God bless you.